In Argentina, electoral campaigns close as part of the schedule ahead of the second round of presidential elections to be held on Sunday. In Palestine, telecom companies have reported the entire communication network has gone out in Gaza after the region has run out of fuel. And in Spain, the candidate of the Socialist Spanish Workers' Party, Pedro Sánchez, was invested as president of the government of the country before the Congress of Deputies. Hello, welcome to From the South. My name is Belén de los Santos from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. On Thursday in Argentina, the electoral campaign closes as part of the schedule for the second round of the presidential elections. The candidates of Union for the Homeland and Liberty Advances are finalizing proposals that will stimulate the vote of the undecided. In this sense, the official candidate Sergio Massa will hold this Thursday a meeting with businessmen of the Inter-American Council of Commerce and Production before the beginning of the closing of the voting period for next Sunday's ballot. Meanwhile, the ultra-right candidate Javier Milei will close his electoral campaign in the capital of Córdoba, where his supporters are expected to carry out a caravan in support of the candidate. On Wednesday, the Peruvian Congress approved the censure of the Minister of the Interior, Vicente Romero, for the increase in citizen insecurity. The parliamentary decision obtained 75 votes in favor, 25 against, and 13 abstentions. These results imply Romero's resignation. According to the Peruvian legal framework, the designated president, Dina Boluarte, has a maximum term of 72 hours to accept the decision and appoint a new minister. The parliamentary questioned the strategic used by the ministers to stop the increase of crimes in the country, alleging that the measures were ineffective. The Congress of the Republic agrees to census the Minister of the Interior, Vicente Romero Fernandez, for the considerations contained in motions 8911 and 8927 that demonstrate his manifest technical incapacity of leadership and lack of suitability for the exercise of the position in accordance with Article 132 of the Political Constitution of Peru and Article 86 of the Regulation of the Congress of the Republic, subscribed by Congressman Eduardo Castillo and Margot Palacios. On Wednesday, local media highlighted that the demonstrators that congregated in the surrounding of the Congress of Guatemala were brutally repressed by security forces. The demonstrators came to reject the swearing-in of the new magistrates of the Supreme Court of Justice, which they consider a parliamentary maneuver to prevent the elected government from taking office next year. The Congress suspended the discussion on the budget to elect 13 new magistrates after a delay of four years and 259 attempts. 13 new magistrates of the Constitutional Court were elected. In the meantime, social movements assured that they will remain in the streets until the elected authorities take office on January 14th so that the will of the people is respected. Many of you have acted at the level of resistance in the towns and we thank you. We have given you food from the territories, so we have given you your food, we have given your glasses of pure word. You have no violated us either, but we have told you that we are going to take list of who you are and if you attack the people just like those who are there, we are going to ask that you face justice in the change of command on the 14th at the 14 o'clock. That is what we have told you. So think about it if you are going to attack your people. Think about it if you are going to attack your brothers. And Venezuela will hold a historical referendum on the Esequibo next December 3rd. Different political and social organizations have shown their resounding support to the referendum, uniting all the people. To know further details about this upcoming political event, let's watch the following report. Ahead of the referendum on the Guyana-Esequiba region, Venezuela stands strong and united. 
representatives of parties from all the political spectrum come together in defense of the disputed territory, leaving their differences aside. The first cry of unity comes from the president of the Bolivarian Republic, Nicolás Maduro Moros. Un debate que nos lleve a encontrarnos, a reencontrarnos. A debate that leads us to meet, to come together, that leads us to united national criteria, in strong ideas, defended by all. It is not time for a debate to dissolve public opinion. It is not time for a debate to divide Venezuelans. It is time for a debate to unite the national soul into a whole. Up to the occasion, leaders of different political parties gathered at the headquarters of the electoral power, pledging their commitment with the referendum. We are very happy that the parties, the majority of the political parties that have so far manifested their commitment to work on this referendum, to do everything possible so that all of them participate, all united in the referendum on the Esequibo. Political forces of the left, the center, and the far right stated that the campaign for the Esequibo is a cross-cutting issue in which all converge and find common ground, democracy and legitimate defense of the rights of all Venezuelans. We're going to be there on December the 3rd because the referendum does not belong to the government. The referendum does not belong to the opposition. The referendum belongs to all Venezuelans who believe that this territory is ours. And I hope that when Dr. Elvis Amoroso announces the unanimous participation that will take place on December the 3rd, all Venezuelans that have this flag, opponents and Chavistas, will be able to celebrate a victory that is not of the government or the opposition but of the Venezuelans. In previous weeks, this opposition leader asked the Attorney General for legal actions against the President of Guyana, Irfan Ali, in addition to sanctioning the companies that operate in marine areas that are pending to be delimited and under dispute. We have to become one. This is not a problem of internal politics. It is a problem of the state and we have to respond to this with great seriousness and responsibility and that is what we have come to ask the Attorney General. Guyana has also consolidated positions regarding the dispute over the Ezequibo. That is why in the street demonstrations in Venezuela, the spirit of unity stands out. All Venezuelan men and women were united to defend the homeland. There is no decision of color, no decision of race, no decision of threat. All of us for the Venezuelan we went out for the OJREF that is ours. <laughs> The referendum is useful because it allows us to tell those who believe that we are divided, to tell all Venezuelans on December the 3rd, to tell them with clarity, with strength, look, yes, here in Venezuela, in the houses, in the Venezuelan family, we have arguments, but don't come to my house because you will find us united, all Venezuelans. Venezuelans keep supporting the referendum, showcasing that beyond all differences and divisions, the defense of national unity stands paramount. Gladys Quesada, Telesur, Caracas, Venezuela. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. At the U.S. Congress, senators approved a temporary funding package that does not include aid to either Israel or Ukraine. The U.S. Senate, which met until late into the night, postponed the confrontation over the federal budget until next year. The vote was overwhelming, 87 votes for this final decision and only 11 against. The measure goes directly to President Joseph Biden's desk, and this time there is no chance that the head of the state will refuse its approval, as it could paralyze the country. This proposal excludes financial aid to Israel and Ukraine, as well as spending on humanitarian aid and border security. 
In Panama, the United People Alliance will start a national strike against the mining deal in upcoming hours. The only trade union of construction and alike and the Association of Teachers, among other organizations, request their government to repeal the 406 law, which approves the mining concession deal for 20 extendable years in order to allow the Canadian company to exploit the biggest mine of Central America exclusively. Unions, social, indigenous students and peasant organizations ratify that it's about struggling for their lives and Panama's future. In 11 days, the Supreme Court of Justice will rule in favor of it, the unconstitutionality of the mining concession deal. And the fight against the mine is a fight for life because the hectares illegitimately negotiated by the Panamanian executive are located in the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor, a protected area. The mine has cost health and life for years to the indigenous communities and for that reason oncology patients also raise their voice. The patients of the oncology hospital say no to mining. Panama is worth more without mining. The goal of Panama is green. Who taught us to fight? Victoriano Dalia Urraca and this Vera Wense, Bocas del Toro, Cheriki, up, up, Boca, and all our provinces. Long live to Panama. The patients of the oncology hospital will say no to mining. On Thursday, local media in Haiti reported that police forces in a hospital rescued more than 100 people who were kidnapped by a powerful gang in Port-au-Prince. Jose Ulises, director of the Fontaine Hospital Center, located in the Cité Soleil neighborhood, confirmed that the place, which also serves as a refuge for those fleeing violence, was brutally attacked. In that sense, the police evacuated 40 children and 70 patients in armored cars to residences in safer places. According to the police report, those responsible for the attack are members of the powerful Brooklyn gang under the command of Gabriel Jean-Pierre, alias T. Gabriel. According to the National Network for the Defense of Human Rights in Haiti, around 90% of the country is under the control of armed gangs. And on Wednesday in Bolivia, the state-owned company known in Spanish as Yacimientos Petrolíferos Fiscales Bolivianos confirmed the sale of 2,000 metric tons of liquefied petroleum gas to the Paraguayan company Petropar in the framework of resuming commercial operations. Armin Dorgaten, president of the state-owned company, said it was very positive to have a customer like Petropar. In this sense, he explained that the consumption needs of the neighboring company will be covered with the available surpluses from the Carlos Villegas liquid separation plant out of the 2,000 tons agreed. Dorgaten also assured that they already sent 1,636 tons and the rest will be commercialized in the next few days. This commercial operation marks the resumption of relations after they were suspended in the year 2020. On Friday in Palestine, telecommunication company Shawal and Paltel announced the network went out of service after all energy sources were depleted as a result of failure to allow fuel into the besieged territory. The companies wrote in statements on social network X on that all sources of energy supporting the grid have been shut down. They had warned on Wednesday that Gaza was facing a complete blackout due to a lack of fuel to operate main data centers and switches. In the sense, both companies confirmed they moved basic elements of the network to rely on batteries. As a consequence, cellular and internet services in Gaza have now been interrupted, leaving its 2.3 million residents largely cut off from the outside world and from each other. 
and the Israeli occupation forces do not cease their siege against the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza, even after destroying it almost in its entirety. Armed clashes have occurred on all roads leading to the health center. The Israeli troops contacted the families still living around Al-Shifa, telling them to leave their homes immediately. They are in this way being forced to walk in the middle of in the middle of the line of fire. At this hour, despite the occupiers' threats warning about future bombings, the families remain in what is left of their homes. Al Shifa is surrounded by tanks and troops, while, according to on site correspondents, of the 24 hospitals on the strip, only one is still operational. And human rights organizations, media and regional governments have been categorical in confirming that Israel lied about the Al-Shifa hospital, the largest in Gaza, now destroyed. Two grotesque videos were published by the Zionist forces. The first one was withdrawn in the reign of criticism and mockery. Israel bombed for a week a hospital full of patients, medical personnel and refugees with the excuse that it was the center of operations of Hamas. They have broadcasted images showing only about 20 old rifles, computers without passwords and have arrested 200 people who were taken out of the hospital blindfolded without informing the reason or their destination. Medical organizations also reported that the equipment of the World Health Organization were reduced to scrap metal. And on Wednesday, at least 50 Palestinian civilians were killed by Israel after shelling of a mosque while worshippers were still praying. The events took place in the mosque in the Al Sabra neighborhood in the center of Gaza. According to the Europe and Middle East Human Rights Monitor, the Israeli attacks have destroyed 66 mosques and caused very serious damage to 146 others since it began its genocidal operation in Gaza. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights guarantees the right to religion of all human beings, and therefore these attacks constitute a crime against humanity. On the same day, the Zionist army attacked a school in the refugee camp Nusserat, where three other Palestinians were killed. And we have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel, Atelisor English, and there you will be able to re-watch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back. In Spain, the candidate of the Socialist Spanish Workers' Party, Pedro Sánchez, was invested on Thursday as president of the government of the country before the Congress of the Deputies. For the third consecutive time in five years, the Spanish mandatory was elected before the House of Deputies, counting with 179 votes in favor and 171 against. During Wednesday and Thursday, the president of the government, Sanchez, debated with the speaker of all the political parties and received the support of at least seven of them. Sanchez received the confidence of the chamber after the registration of the amnesty law in the Congress of Deputies. The amnesty agreement was signed with the Catalan independentist parties, the Republican Left of Catalonia and Together for Catalonia, and protects those investigated for the secessionist process that developed in the Catalonia during the last decade. And in Russia, local foreign minister Sergei Lavrov met his Venezuelan counterpart Ivan Hill, and the top diplomats highlighted the role of the BRICS in strengthening the de-dollarization process. Lavrov and Hill praised the relations between Caracas and Moscow based on trust and bilateral respect. Lavrov also assured that the cooperation links with Venezuela are part of Moscow's strategies to contribute to the development of various regions of the planet. 
For his part, the Venezuelan representative said that relations between the two countries are at their best moment and reaffirmed the willingness of the Bolivarian country to strengthen spaces for joint benefit both in economic and political fields. To continue to raise the level of relations, it is a relationship that is very fluid. There are change at other levels of our minister, our directors, our public officials in all miles of political economic life and aspect beyond that collaboration. They are developing efficiently and we have reviewed each of them in these negotiations. Likewise, the Venezuelan diplomat also referred to the issue of the financial architecture, the MIR platform in the Venezuelan territory. The MIR platform, which allows the use of this Russian way of payment in Venezuela, is operating throughout the national territory. There is a 100% coverage of the territory. More than 79,000 payment terminals are currently active, working in almost all Venezuelan business and stores. The card can be used. We are talking about almost 40% of Venezuelan payment terminals have this system already incorporated on the island of Margarita and in tourist area. It is a 100% coverage. There is all Russian tourists or tourists using the MIR payment system can work. For his part, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stressed the decision and the need to accelerate and promote agreements and projects in different areas as part of the multilateralism. We have numerous projects in the field of oil production, gas field development, agriculture, medicine, pharmaceuticals, communications, new technologies. In all areas, it was decided to increase the pace and volume of cooperation in accordance with the agreement reached on October 16 at the 17th session of the Russian-Venezuelan High-Level Intergovernmental Commission. We know the improvement of transport connectivity between our countries, stable air connection between Moscow and Caracas, as well as a number of Russian cities and the Venezuelan tourists on the island of Margarita. This contributes to the increase of tourist flow from Russia to Venezuela. The Russian diplomat stressed that the illegitimate unilateral sanctions by the United States are largely responsible for the problems in the Venezuelan economy due to the blockade of assets at the international level. We have confirmed our assessment according to which the problems of the national economy that have been shown in recent years are largely caused by the illegitimate unilateral sanctions of the United States, including the blockade of Venezuelan state assets abroad which is unacceptable from any point of view. In Bangladesh, exceeds 1,500 dengue fevers occurred since January this year. According to the General Directorate of Health Services of the Asian country, the number of deaths rose to 1,520 on Wednesday, with 24 cases registered in the last 24 hours. This is in addition to the more than 1,600 hospitalized bringing the number of contagious to more than 296,000, beg your pardon. According to the report of the health authorities, dengue fever is usually mild or asymptomatic. However, the disease can also produce high fevers, headaches, among other symptoms, and in severe cases, hemorrhages in the gums, abdominal pain, or even death. In China, a fire has left at least 26 people dead and more than 70 injured. The fire started on Thursday morning at the headquarters of a coal plant belonging to the Yongqiu Company, located in the northern province of Shangxi. The authorities activated the operation to rescue the people who were still in the facilities. We evacuated about 70 people, 63 of whom were taken to local hospitals. Also, investigations were started to determine the cause of the fire. And on Thursday, Cuba's mythical capital, Havana, opens its balconies to celebrate 504 years since its foundation as San Cristóbal de La Habana. Founded in 1519 by the Spanish conquistadors, Havana became in the 17th century an important site for the Caribbean region. Old Havana, according to experts, has maintained the pattern of the early 
urban environment with its five large squares, each with its own architectural character. The city as a whole covers 732 square kilometers and has 15 municipalities, of which nine are totally urban. Its streets reveal, especially in the old region, the reason why UNESCO declared it a World Heritage Site in 1982. However, its people are the true essence of its traditions in the present and the future. And like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. Before saying goodbye, we want to thank our Caribbean audience, especially the audience of Trinidad and Tobago. We are pleased to share our newscast and contribute to provide an alternative news source of the world's recent events. You can find these and many other stories at our website at telesorenglish.net and also join us on social media at Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Belen de los Santos. Thank you for watching.